couple of years ago came in in the middle of the night, she's 80, uh, with two clots in the brain and uh, she was, Teddy's team retrieved the clot, clots, plural, and she came out um, as, she, as she was before she ever had the stroke. So pretty amazing. So Teddy's a stroke neurologist. I'm also a neurologist. Uh, my name's Tim Anderson. Uh, but I'm a movement disorders neurologist. I look after people with problems with movement, including Parkinson's disease. And, and uh, you heard from Michael that uh, Cass van der Veer had Parkinson's and he was our major donor. Um, but actually he was looked after by Ivan Donaldson before me. Uh, and so Ivan was my mentor uh, and encouraged me into this area which I'm in. So I'm forever grateful, Ivan. And Ivan's here today and uh, is on our board. But I'm going to talk about Huntington's, not as common as Parkinson's. Um, and I'm sure you've all got um, someone that you know who has Parkinson's. And some of you, uh, not so many, will know someone with Huntington's. Um, and I'm going to talk about that condition. It's, um, uh, it's an increasing disorder. And, and I'm going to tell you why that is. And the, the, the title of my, of my talk, if you can see it, is New Hope on the Horizon. And I made up this slide two days ago. And, uh, things have changed a little since then, since yesterday morning, and it's new hope on the horizon, perhaps. Um, and I'll, I'll go into the reasons for that. So um, the name comes from George Huntington, who was a, a doctor, a phys just a general practitioner in the States, and he wrote the, the first description of Huntington's disease. But in fact, it was his father and his grandfather, who were both doctors, and he took over their practice, um, who, who actually who actually looked after patients with Huntington's, but he was the one who, who first described it. Um, and you probably don't know much about Huntington's. Basically, there are three main features to people who have Huntington's. Firstly, um, they have involuntary movements, which are not like tremor of Parkinson's, but more um, jiggly movements. And um, I'm going to show you um, a video of... Uh, so these two folks on the right have these involuntary movements. They're father and son. I saw them just a couple of weeks ago, and the woman is, is, is the mother and wife. And you can see these movements, which interfere with movement and, and unsteadiness. So the, the son developed his problem at about the same age, at the same time, I should say, as his father. And the reasons for that uh, I'm going to explain. Um, and the reason for that is one of the reasons why Huntington's is becoming more and more prevalent. The other problems, apart from those movements, is that in time, people develop cognitive decline and eventually dementia, uh, and uh, behavioural problems as well, so many people may get depression or psychotic illness. So it's not a pleasant condition, and in many, but not everyone, will lead to premature death. So Huntington's, unlike Parkinson's, where there is a genetic um, component, Huntington's is very much a genetic disease. It's passed on in families. And um, if the father has a gene or the mother has a gene, they will pass it on to half the children. The children have half a chance, um, of 50% chance of, of getting the bad gene um, from their, one of their parents, the affected parent, and they get the normal gene um, from the other parent. So you have two um, pairs of genes, one with, with the mutant, it's called the mutant gene, and the other with the normal gene. Um, and we all make Huntington protein. In fact, all our genes basically make proteins. That's what they're there to do. Uh, and one of the proteins our genes make is Huntington protein. And you've all got Huntington protein in your brain. It's normal to have it, and we need it for normal brain function. But if you have the abnormal one, the mutant Huntington uh, gene, which makes the mutant Huntington protein, then your brain will start to get um, it will go awry, and you'll get the problems that I just showed you on that video. So, so children of affected parents have about a 50% chance. They either get it or they don't. Um, the thing about Huntington's, uh, partly, well, there's quite a few things about Huntington's. One is that it, it's, it's more prevalent in different parts of the world. That's because there's basically a founder effect. So Huntington's probably started off in one person many, many um, centuries ago and gradually spread through um, parts of the world. It started in Caucasian population. And so it's more common still in Caucasian uh, or populations which have a large Caucasian um, element. The age of onset varies uh, because the size of the gene, of the mutant gene, the bad gene, is different in different people. 
So it's called an expansion. So the gene is a, a repeat, so that there are some what's called nucleotides that make up the gene. And for all of us, or most of us here, if you haven't got Huntington's, you'll have a number of about 18 from your, from your father and about 18 or 17 on average from your mother. But it varies. So, uh, you know, one person here might have uh, from her mother um, maybe 14 and from her father 18, but you'll be fine. So there's a little bit of variation. But in Huntington's disease, the gene is expanded and it, it, it expands, if, if, it, if it's expanded into an intermediate zone, you may not get Huntington's at all um, until you live to a very um, old age. The other problem um, in Huntington's genetics is uh, something called anticipation. So you might have um, a gene, especially if you're male, you may have a gene that isn't going to cause Huntington's in you because it's not quite big enough. It's sitting on the edge, on the cusp. But when you pass that onto your children or one of your children, it can get bigger in that passage from one generation to the next. So you might um, have a gene that's of a length of, let's say, 37 or 38, which puts you in a sort of intermediate zone, whereas, whereas if you live to 100, you might get some symptoms. But your child, may, when you pass it down, may have a bigger one. And that person put it over 40 in size. And if you've got 40, you're going to get the condition in due course. So that's why the father and the son um, developed their condition at the same time. The father um, had five um, repeats less than the son. When he passed on his gene to his son, he gave, it a, he gave him a bigger uh, repeat length, and so they developed at the same time. So that's um, one reason why um, hunting is getting more prevalent, because uh, down the generations, the gene is getting bigger, and more people have time to develop it as they get older. So the smaller the gene, the, the less chance you have of getting it until you get very old. Um, and so Huntington's is becoming more prevalent. And so now we're seeing people in their 70s, 80s, and even someone uh, we saw last year who developed symptoms at the age of 90 uh, because that, that, that person only had a small number of repeats but just over the margin that, that causes the Huntington's. So we're seeing increasing numbers of people with Huntington's as, a, a, you know, as the years go by. Um, so it's becoming more prevalent. This is just showing you what I've really explained, and you won't be able to see it much, um, but here's the expanded gene. It's, it's larger in the person who's going to get Huntington's, and here's a normal-sized gene. And as I mentioned, if you've got a number over 39, you're going to get the condition. It's inevitable, as long as you don't die of, you know, at the age of 30 from something else. But there are these zones um, in the middle between normal repeat number, which is less than 26, and over 39, where there's A, reduced penetrance between 36 and 39, which basically means that if you live to be old enough, you'll, you'll get the condition. Or you may be in the unstable um, area, this is 27 to 35, where you'll never get the condition, but as I mentioned before, when you pass on your gene to the next generation, you might be passing it from the unstable zone into the reduced penetrance zone, and therefore that child of yours may get the condition if they live to 80 or 90, and that person, when they pass on the next generation, can pass it on into the affected range. And that's why it's getting more, more, more common. So we need to do something about the gene, if we can. And that's where the new hope um, has come in. It's, it's working on the, on the gene itself. Well, actually, at the moment, it's working on suppressing the gene, uh, translating that into the protein. Remember I mentioned that um, that it, we all have Huntington protein, and the genes basically encode for proteins. They're there to make proteins, Huntington protein, which we all need. This, this new form of treatment called antisense oligonucleotide, which you may read about, um, is an artificial DNA that's made in the lab, and it, and it can be injected into the spinal fluid, where it can then go to the brain. And what it does, it, it doesn't do anything to the gene itself, but what it does is it interferes with the messenger that goes from the gene to the protein factory in the cell. So the gene encodes for that protein, the Huntington protein, but it needs a little messenger, a courier, to take it from home, if you like, to the factory, the ribosome which makes the protein. And this particular type of treatment interferes with that messenger and stops it getting to the factory to make the abnormal protein. Uh, and so you can reduce the, the, the bad protein. And that's what um, we have known in the last year or two that can happen. And there's a study um, 
made by Roche just a few years ago with about 40 people with Huntington's where they dosed people into the spinal fluid with this treatment and reduced the amount of Huntington protein in the fluid by 50%. And in animals that looked as if it worked and, and, and slowed down the course of people's Huntington's. So there's been a lot of hope um, this will work in humans. And so we've been participating um, in a study, a um, worldwide study of 800 people with Huntington's, uh, which has been running for almost two years, treating um, locally nine people with Huntington's uh, with this treatment, lumbar punches every two months, injecting this material. So here's um, our anaesthetist, Susie Newton, putting a lumbar puncture needle in, and we're collecting some spinal fluid for analysis, and then we're injecting this treatment. Into, uh, into this patient of ours, he doesn't mind being seen. And we do a lot of tests, and that's me on the right doing this movement, and that's him on the left with slightly slower movements. And we, and we do this every two months to see if things are improving or at least slowing down. We don't know the result, or well, we didn't know the results of the study, it was still ongoing, until yesterday we got this message um, from the company Roche to say that we had to stop giving the treatment, even though some of our patients have almost finished their two years treatment because there's been some signal, um, unfortunately, sadly, uh, that tells us that it either it's, it's not effective enough and or there's got some problems with it. Not serious problems, but enough to stop the study. So it's been pretty devastating for us, actually, I have to say, um, having this treatment and for, of course, our patients and the Huntington's community. But I don't think it's too devastating yet because once the, the, the um, data is analysed, there may be signals of who should get the treatment and so forth. The other thing is, that instead of trying to, to stop the messenger, um, you can actually, these days, potentially silence the gene itself with other forms of treatment. And eventually, you would have heard of gene editing, and there's a potential to cut the gene out, the bad gene and not the good one, because the good one's still making normal protein, and you want to cut the bad one out. And we think there's hope for the future, but at the moment, there's a little bit of a stall. So that's my message. I don't want to leave it on a sort of pessimistic note, but that's science. You know, uh, two steps forward, one step back. <laughs>